if we can have that same spirit, revive the spirit of Beijing and say, yes, we can. I think that will be what I call accelerated action. Hello and welcome to Qatar 365 with me, Laila Humaira. On this episode, we mark International Women's Day by telling the inspiring stories of women determined to accelerate action. This year's chosen theme. Adel Halim met some powerful first ladies who had pretty strong words for global leaders. But first, I'm here in Education City to find out more about the institutions that have a high number of young women pursuing STEM subjects. These are no ordinary pair of shoes. They've been modified to meet the sensory needs of children with autism. And these are the extraordinary young engineers behind the invention. Eighth grade students Sarah Faisal Aldosari and Mira Yusuf Alkabi. So our main goal is to help the parents find their children if they ever get lost, because especially uh, autism patients, uh, they feel more scared and they can go anywhere. To make what they call the smart autism shoe, Sarah and Mira took apart a regular pair of shoes and installed a GPS tracker motherboard which they made themselves. So also here we have an SOS button. In case the child feels unsafe at any point, any time, any point, the child feels unsafe, they want their parents to know, they press it, their parents will receive an SMS with their location, with everything. The Smart Autism Shoe got them a place on Qatar Foundation's edutainment program, Stars of Science, as the youngest innovators on the show. I've always liked solving things. So engineering for me, when there, whenever there was a problem to solve, I never found it as something that was boring. From aspiring engineers to an accomplished scientist, I've come over to the Manufactory Building, which is part of Education City, to meet Dr. Fadwa El Maluhi. It's in these halls and research labs that Dr. Fadwa is imparting her knowledge in STEM to students and where she and her colleagues are shaping Qatar's future generation of scientists and engineers. Just like Sarah and Mira, Dr. Fadwa's love for science ignited when she was 12. She's never looked back since, even when she's found herself being the only woman in the room. The day I wanted to, uh, really to become a physicist was during middle school. And that day I said, oh no, I want to be a researcher, I want to be a scientist and I want to be a physicist. Dr. Fadwa's passion for engineering made her dive into the world of material science. Her research led to launching a startup called Aisha Informatics a digital decarbonization platform which can be used at an industrial scale to slow down the effect of the climate crisis. I have the power actually to simulate um, materials, processes in uh, large supercomputers and there is uh, a way that we can decarbonize businesses and make them achieve their uh, decarbonization uh, targets much faster than the 10 to 20 years <laughs> because we don't have time. Part of that equation is also playing her part to inspire a new generation, a role that Dr. Fadwa fully embraces inside the classroom and out. I was really glad to hear about the story of Sarah and Mira. In Qatar, we're really blessed. So at least 50% of the students are female. They're coming forward, they're not shy, like the way, <laughs> the way I was. But perhaps in her own way, the tenacity of Dr. Fadwa lives in students like Sarah and Mira, who are certainly not shy to spread their love for engineering. STEM comes at any age, like you can start as young as we are. Um, and I want my peers to understand that they can do it and they just have to put the work in. 150 years. That's how long the World Economic Forum says it could take for gender parity in economic opportunities to be achieved at the current pace. And while that can sound demoralizing to some, others choose to focus on changing as many lives as they can while also inspiring others to pay it forward. One such individual is Her Excellency Bianz Gavanas. Vice Chair of the Global Fund, and I got a chance to meet the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations to find out what fuels her dedication to women's empowerment. I first wanted to start with your role at the Global Fund. Can you map out the organization's strategies and goals? Representing the Global Fund, um, as you know, it was established in 20, uh, 2002. And the main aim at the time of the Global Fund was 
to fight the three diseases, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. Our strategy that we have now adopted is talking about um, you know, human-centered approaches. It focuses on gender, and it also speaks to issues of resilient health systems. And so over the years, by investing in the three diseases, we also strengthened health systems. So when we look at um, the fight for gender parity and gender equality, so often we see that the time to parity is some seemingly unreachable figure. So how can we as a collective as individuals, as governments, as organizations, stay focused to achieving this common goal. The measurement of progress, of women's progress, is not just about the numbers in parliament or in cabinet. It is looking at that village woman who show resilience within her community and has built up her community despite all the challenges. I think seeing women in various positions nowadays. It does inspire young women. And I'm always saying to young people or young women, when I occupy these positions, it's not because I fell from heaven or that I'm an alien. I'm a daughter of Africa from Namibia that started where I started in my life to where I have become. Um, obstacles, yes, they are always there. But if I can, then surely every girls should be able to. And I hope it don't take another 135 years, but here we are, here I am. The theme for International Women's Day 2025 is Accelerate Action. What does that mean to you? And what is your message to women who are watching all over the world, no matter how old they are and no matter where they are? We must make a lot of noise. We must be noticed much more than we ever had been but it's important that we stand together as a collective, that we recommit ourselves to that vibe that existed at Beijing. We need to reflect back and say to ourselves, what was it that made thousands of women come together in Beijing and say to themselves, women matter. Say to themselves, women rights, are human rights. So if we can have that same spirit, revive the spirit of Beijing and say, yes, we can, I think that will be what I call accelerated action. Not to continue to be good girls, but to be bad girls <laughs> too. <laughs> Officially recognized by the UN General Assembly in 2020, the International Day to Protect Education from Attack brings together global leaders, UN dignitaries and youth advocates. The goal is to bring international attention to attacks on educational institutions, which the Education Above All Foundation says increased 20% from the previous year. Adel Halim explains why delegates are calling on governments to ensure schools are safe spaces, free from violence and threats. Some of the most influential women in the world gathered in Qatar with one goal in mind, to call on the international community to prevent attacks on educational institutions. Education should not be a privilege to I mean, choose and feel. Education is a human right. And if no one is willing to talk or to save the lives of these children. We should also use our voices and amplify the need for peace globally. Sierra Leone was at war for more than a decade, until 2002. Two decades later, the country's first lady says part of rebuilding means spending a lot on education. When you destroy education, that country will be backward for many, many, many years. Liberia's foreign affairs minister has also seen education come under assault in her country. The human cost of war cannot be calculated. And for each school that's attacked, for each school that has been rendered, you know, um, incapacitated in terms of means to serve the needs of the children, you're attacking the future. The United Nations Population Fund says 63% of the population is under 25 years old. Some are ex-combatants and face formidable challenges ahead. One message that came out very clearly, which I fully agree with, the world is in chaos. Put women at the helm and the world will change.
Nurul Izza Anwar was a Malaysian member of parliament for three terms. She was excited to see a wide-ranging and diverse panel of powerful female voices. I love that most of the voices were from the global south because it's so, it's so hard sometimes to even know that these experiences are so valid and relevant to, to girls of today that we're not hearing from the positions of entitlement or, or judgmental uh, tone, but actually lived experiences. The high-level event was organized by Education Above All, a global foundation trying to push for quality access to education everywhere in the world. We find that our problems are just growing faster than the solutions. In the last few years, there's been a 20% increase in the amount of conflict and therefore the number of children who are out of school or in need. During live war, often the attention is on humanitarian support and not on long-term development support. We do our best in that field as well, but we also really, really push and promote the kind of build back better philosophy. As Sierra Leone continues to rebuild itself after a decade-long war, its first lady has a message to young girls in attendance or watching at home. Do not allow anybody kill your dream and that focus on your education. If we continue to bring each other up like that, nobody will be left behind. From young engineers to accomplished diplomats, we've seen how representation, support and empowerment can help fuel the aspirations of women no matter how old they are or where they live. We hope you've been inspired by the incredible women we've met in this episode, but that's all the time we have for now. For more, check out euronews.com and connect with us through our hashtag. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Qatar 365.